So thank you very much. I'm so delighted to be here with you today. It's been so stimulating and really so moving to hear such a fascinating series of talks. So now for something completely different. I'm here to talk to you about some of the issues that we at NOVA face in communicating science to the public on television and online. NOVA has been on the air since 1973, which means we're in our 42nd season. That's an eternity in television. It's longer than Seinfeld, I Love Lucy, and Friends, <laughs> though General Hospital still has a few years on us. So these numbers show our reach. Four to five million people watch us on television every week, and another two million visit our website every month. In all, around 52 million people see NOVA at some point each year. Now, that's a lot of people. But when Mike Ambrosino began NOVA in the 1970s, he did so amid widespread skepticism that anybody would watch a science program on television. But over the years, we've learned that if you tell a good story, bring in strong characters, and show people visuals they can't see anywhere else, they will come. Of course, the devil is in the details. It's never going to be easy to explain epigenetics or dark energy or how the immune system works. But with that formula of story, character, and visuals, it's not only possible, but it's doable week after week. Last week, we broadcast a show called The Great Math Mystery. Now, there's nothing less obviously made for television than math. <laughs> but the ratings for that show were right up there with many of our most popular episodes. And this prologue will give you a good take on the approach. Roger, copy mission. We live in an age of astonishing advances. Sending at about 0.75 meters per second. Engineers can land a car-sized rover on Mars. Touchdown, confirmed. Receive. <laughs> Physicists probe the essence of all matter, while we communicate wirelessly on a vast worldwide network. But underlying all of these modern wonders is something deep and mysteriously powerful. It's been called the language of the universe, and perhaps it's civilization's greatest achievement. Its name? Mathematics. But where does math come from? And why in science does it work so well? Albert Einstein wondered how is it possible that mathematics does so well in explaining the universe as we see it? Is mathematics even human? There doesn't really seem to be an upper limit to the numerical abilities of animals. And is it the key to the cosmos? Our physical world doesn't just have some mathematical properties, but it has only mathematical properties. The Great Math Mystery on NOVA. So that show, which was supported by the Simons Foundation, confronted viewers with a provocative question. Is math invented or discovered? And wove a story around it, humanizing mathematicians and visualizing difficult concepts to bring an abstract subject down to earth. In 1959, the British scientist C.P. Snow gave an influential lecture bemoaning the separation of Western society into two cultures, the sciences and the humanities. Snow's focus was intellectual, but now the same problem is more widespread. Many of us believe that science belongs to an elite of impossibly bright people whose work mere mortals could never understand. It isn't surprising, then, that science intimidates people and sometimes turns them off. Some, believing that science is in conflict with their religion or values, become skeptical of its findings and methods. And that's a disaster when so many of the problems our society faces, such as climate change, energy, cybercrime, and disease, depend on science for solutions. So one of the main challenges we face is making programs about these important issues, which, while scientific in nature, have become politicized and divisive. So let's start with the mother of all science-based controversies, <laughs> evolution. 
which is universally accepted among biologists, but questioned by a significant portion of Americans. The numbers differ from poll to poll, but in 2012, Gallup found that 46% of Americans agreed that, quote, God created human beings pretty much in their present form in the last 10,000 years. Now, for many years, we at NOVA stayed away from the controversy for fear of legitimizing it. But then school committee members in the small town of Dover, Pennsylvania, demanded that biology teachers include intelligent design in the <coughs> curriculum. In 2005, a trial resulted that afforded us a great way into the controversy. More than a debate over legal issues, it turned out to be a primer on evolution with scientists as the main witnesses. Here's a letter from a student at Ohio State whose professor showed our two-hour special, Judgment Day, Intelligent Design on Trial, in class. He said, I am a 30-year-old active-duty Marine. I was raised in a really firm Christian home where evolution was not even considered an option. Your film made me realize that evolution and religion can both exist together. I would never have believed I could come around to this way of thinking. I feel as though a light went off and everything you've been talking about fell into place. Another scientific subject mired in controversy is climate change. We have been covering this topic since 1983, and it's always a struggle to get people to watch. Here's the problem. Television as a medium depends on dramatic storytelling, good visuals, action scenes, and definite outcomes. Now, contrast that with the nature of climate change, a largely <laughs> invisible, long-term problem with large doses of bad news and uncertainty. The journalist Andy Revkin once commented, I can't imagine anything harder to cover than global warming on television. Well, there might be one subject that's harder, <laughs> and that's vaccination. Literally a life and death issue, it hits people in a very emotional way. As a mother and grandmother, I personally have very little patience with people who question vaccination. But as a journalist, that attitude is not all that helpful. Social science research tells us that confronting people with facts proving they're wrong doesn't change their minds. It just hardens their position. So in our show, Vaccines Calling the Shots, a collaboration between Nova and Tangled Bank Studios, we decided to take a different approach, featuring not strident vaccine resistors, but vaccine-hesitant parents who were looking for guidance. In this program, we told stories of children stricken with preventable diseases, explained how vaccines work, and acknowledged their real but very tiny risks. We showed why even very small declines in vaccination rates can have devastating consequences. And we explored the autism issue, telling the story of how one mother, whose face will be very familiar to this audience, came to understand that the link between autism and vaccination is based on bogus and discredited research. This beautiful girl is my daughter Jody. She's 16 and she has autism and now she's in residential placement. And I'm here today as I am every weekend visiting her. It's the highlight of my week. As a parent, I would it's love to really have a better understanding of why she yeah, behaves the way she behaves or why we have to go through the same rituals and routines and every single time. We need to understand so that we can help her. Allison Singer channeled her need for answers, becoming an autism advocate, raising funds for research. Allison noticed Jody's symptoms around the same time as her daughter had her vaccinations. So she, like many parents, suspected there could be a link. In 1998, an English doctor, Andrew Wakefield, argued there was a link between autism and MMR the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. His study of 12 children was published in a major medical journal, The Lancet. 
When I read that, I was taken aback. We have to look at this. Fortunately, those are studies that can be done. A search began to see if a link between autism and the MMR vaccine could be confirmed. Scientists examined the medical records of hundreds of thousands of children. But study after study revealed that whether the children were vaccinated or not, the rates of autism were the same. No one could replicate Andrew Wakefield's findings. Eventually, that study was shown to be fraudulent and it was withdrawn. Similar studies failed to find any link between autism and a mercury-based preservative called thimerosal. Still other studies failed to find any link between autism and the number or timing of vaccines. So at this point, it's not like we have one study or two studies or five studies. We have dozens of studies. I think we were right to look at whether vaccines might be a cause of autism, but there comes a point where there's so much evidence none of which shows any link between vaccines and autism, that you have to say, enough. So in addition to the broadcast audience, this program, which was produced by Sonia Pemberton, has also been seen 100,000 times online. And that's important because while TV remains a great way to reach a mass audience, we're all aware that the internet has surpassed television as the place where most people get their science information. When NOVA began, there were three broadcast networks plus PBS. Now we inhabit a multi-channel universe on TV, and online we confront a chaos of ideas and opinions on science, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Whatever the medium, communicating science is not easy but it's never been so important or so worthwhile. And while there's no simple way to do it, our guidepost at NOVA is to start by inspiring people, to turn them on to the pleasure of finding things out, as the late physicist Richard Feynman used to say. If we can do that, I believe the rest will take care of itself. Thank you.